Okay, I think we'll get started so that we can finish on time. Uh, so I'm Penny. Hi, I'm the Public Engagement Manager at the Royal College of Pathologists. And I'm joined today um, by my colleague, Tarcha Retnaswaran, um, who will wave, I'm sure, um, and two pathologists. So we, we were hoping to have three. Unfortunately, one of them is not well today, so she sends her apologies. But we have uh, the fantastic uh, Dr. Giuseppe Picchieri and Dr. Erin White, um, and they will tell you a bit about what they do shortly, and then they'll show you the activities. Before we start, I just want to share with you um, a really short animation because I realise that some people might not know exactly what pathologist is and hopefully this short animation will just summarise that for you. Pathologists are experts in disease. Their job is to work out what is making someone unwell, advise on their treatment and stop other people getting ill the same way. Pathologists work in laboratories, in clinics and on hospital wards. Every blood test, allergy diagnosis or search for infection will involve a pathology team. People who work in pathology services specialise in particular areas. For example, if you're anaemic, a haematologist will find out why. When you find a lump, a histopathologist will work out if you have cancer or not. If you have diabetes, a chemical pathologist will plan your treatment. And when you've got an infection, a microbiologist will advise whether or not you need antibiotics, and if so, which one. Bridging science and medicine, pathologists underpin every aspect of patient care. Diagnosing, treating and preventing disease, they are a key part of the healthcare team. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a bit of an introduction. <clears throat> so today, obviously, we're here to do some of the activities from Choose Your Own Pathology Adventure. And you might have had a chance to have a look through, um, and we're going to be doing four of them today. If, obviously, we can't see or hear you, which is a shame, but um, if you are doing your own, doing some of the activities as we do them, please do share any pictures and videos on social media, either during the session or afterwards. Um, so please use the hashtag pathology adventure. Um, and you can see our um, social media channels there. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop sharing there and I'm going to introduce our speakers. So Erin, I'll come to you first. Um, Dr. Erin White, if you'd like to just tell everyone um, what, your, what, um, what your job is and, and what you do in pathology. Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, my name's Erin and I'm a trainee histopathologist uh, in Sheffield. I'm just going to share my screen because I've made a quick presentation. Okay. So hopefully we can all see that. So that's me down there. Um, and this is the beautiful Hounshire Hospital in Sheffield, or at least that's the prettiest picture I could find of it. So um, as we kind of just learned from the video, a histopathologist is a type of doctor that uses a microscope to diagnose disease. So um, you have to go to medical school first um, and do a couple of years working as a general doctor on the wards or in GP clinic, uh, and then you can start training, which is where I am now. I'm very junior, so I only started in August. And here's a little bit of ancient Greek for everyone. So histo means tissue, which is what we sort of the word we use to explain what the organs of the body are made of. And pathologist is the study of disease. So essentially, I study disease using a microscope. Um, you might have heard of pathologists, um, sometimes we're on the telly in sort of forensics and crime scene investigation type stuff, uh, but it's not all about that, unfortunately, it's not that exciting most of the time. So I wanted to quickly talk about what happens uh, in the lab, because I'm going to show you how to make a microscope at home, so I thought I'd show you how I use my microscope at work. So um, you've got your doctor, uh, who takes a sample, and in this case she's taken a sample of some bone, and she sends it off to the pathology labs. And that's where we go from having a solid lump of bone to this down here, which is a glass slide with a very thin piece of tissue on that's been dyed pink and purple, so we can look at it more easily under the microscope. That's my microscope there. So if you just ignore my slightly messy desk in the background. Um, so this slide will come to me. I'll have a look and I'll try and come up with a diagnosis that we can tell back to that doctor at the start and help the patient. So here's a um, it's a shame I can't do question and answer live, but basically I took this picture myself down my microscope and this is actually what bone looks like under the microscope. Um, so you can see that sort of pink wavy stuff. 
that's what your bone looks like if you look at it very, very highly magnified. And um, I'm not sure if you can see, but right in the middle, there's kind of like a line of cells on the bottom of that piece of wavy bone. And that's actually, those you know, cells are called osteoblasts and they make new bone. Um, so that's how your bones sort of remodel and um, keep your skeleton nice and healthy. Um, and I just want to show you another quick example of the sort of thing I'd look at. Um, so on the left, we've got a glass slide again, um, but this one's actually been scanned into the computer. So there's a lot of stuff happening in IT at the minute in pathology. So if you're interested in sort of computer and artificial intelligence, it's potentially a really exciting area to work in. Um, so looking at that a bit closer, this has actually come from somebody's gut. So it's somebody who's had stomach aches, a um, bit of diarrhea. And if we zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, you can see the lining of the gut, all those wavy sort of almost like tentacles. Um, and you can see these little sort of oh, like little teardrops, little things sort of in that screen down the bottom. Um, so that's actually Giardia, which is essentially a type of parasite. So that's swimming around in there, laying eggs. And Giuseppe's nodding, which is good because he knows much more about this than me. Um, laying eggs. And that's actually what's making this patient poorly. So we can then go back to them, back to the doctor, give them some antibiotics and hopefully sort that out for them. So, yeah, that's a little introduction to histopathology. Just stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Erin. I think um, we'll introduce, get um, Giuseppe to introduce himself and then we'll move on to the activities. So Giuseppe, I think you're going to tell them about microbiology. Hello, uh, my name is Giuseppe and uh, uh, I'm a microbiologist at Kingston Hospital. And as Erin was saying, um, I mainly deal with uh, microorganisms, with bacteria, viruses, parasites and fungi, which might cause diseases. So what happens is I'm here in the lab and we receive different kinds of samples. We can receive blood samples with lovely different colors, or we can receive swabs, which are taken from different parts of the, the body. And because we want to try and demonstrate whether or not the person has got any specific infection, we can receive urine samples collected into this specific uh, sample, or we can receive, well, you might want to guess what this one is, what this one is for. We might receive a stool sample, a sample from, from uh, uh, poo samples, just to try and see whether or not we've got parasites, like the one that Erin was mentioning before, Jardia. Our role is to try and see if we can identify them, if uh, we can see them under the microscope, if we can culture them, and how once we culture them, we try and assess whether, we try and see whether they've got any specific sensitivities to antibiotics, which means if antibiotics are able to kill those organisms, then we go back and tell our colleagues in the hospital, yes, this bacteria or this parasite or this fungus can be killed by the specific antibiotic. And then we have a conversation about how to best treat the patient. And basically, this is what I do every day. I'm at the phone with my colleague most of the time trying to discuss patients. Thank you, Giuseppe. And um, <clears throat> I, I should have said at the beginning, if you have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A. I think I saw somebody with your hand up. I think if you're able to type into the Q&A what your question is, that'd be great. Um, I have an initial question, actually. Um, the word culture, what does that mean when you say you're culturing something? Yeah, good question. And for bacteria, especially, and fungi, what we try and do is we try and put into a specific media like think of, think of it like a broth like something where the organisms can replicate something that allows them to to grow so we can see we can see them replicating so we can have a sufficient number for them to get tested sorry for them to get tested that's the culture okay. so yeah because they're so small you need a lot of them to be able to see them is that right yes exactly we need lots of them to be able to see them and we need lots of them to be able to perform like what we call sensitivity testing where we challenge them against some antibiotics <clears throat> great thank you i'm sure lots of people here have had antibiotics before so it's interesting to hear how you use those in the lab so um we, we will have lots of time for um asking giuseppe and erin questions at the end which is nice um, but I think we'll move on to the activity. So I hope you've all got various materials ready. Obviously, if you haven't got <clears throat> materials for everything, then that's fine. But um, hopefully you'll be doing something at home. 
Erin, I think, is gonna gonna show us first the um scoping with business cards, which is using just a piece of card to make your own mini microscope. So I will hand over to Erin. Okay, um, hello again, everyone. So we're going to make a microscope. So I've already shown you a picture of the microscope I use, which is very big and unwieldy, so I couldn't really bring it home to show you. Um, but we're gonna have a go at making something that kind of does the same job, or at least works along the same lines. So you're going to need a piece of cardboard. Um, hopefully you've all got one. It doesn't have to be massive, about the size of a business card. Um, and what we need to do, and I found this easier to draw first, is if you draw a rectangle um, and then you've got sort of two dotted lines which are going to be our fold lines these solid lines we're going to cut and this here is where we're going to hole punch so if you've got that done i'll start cutting while you guys do it at home so i'm just going to it's a bit difficult to get started because this card's a bit thick but just going to cut in here and cut this little rectangle out. Hopefully you guys are all doing this at home and then as we get more and more into it I can maybe just quickly explain how microscopes work. So now we've got this bit that sort of folds out. That sort of bottom dotted line which you don't have to draw you can just imagine it if we fold it and then another imaginary dotted line we fold it like that. So you've got this piece of card that hopefully you can see that looks like that. And now, if you've got a hole punch, this little dot, we just do that. So again, it doesn't have to be exact and try and get a little hole in that you can see through. Now this is where I'm gonna get full Blue Peter presenter and here's one I've made earlier. So it's exactly the same as the one I've just made. Um, but what we need to do is where we put that little hole, we just need to put a little bit of sellotape over it. So you've got this see-through little window with a bit of sellotape. So I'll just give you a second to do that while I grab my water. Oh, you've accidentally muted. Hello, I'm back. So we've got our bit of card where uh, it's bent up, we've got this little sort of panel, we've got a little window with our sellotape, and this is what's going to be essentially the base of our microscope. So in order to have a microscope, you need a curved lens. So in my microscope, it's lots of little curved glass lenses. Obviously, we're not going to do glass blowing and make that here, but we can get a similar effect with water. Now, this bit is a bit tricky. Um, I found it a bit tricky anyway. So I've got a glass of water, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dip my finger in and try and get some water hanging off it, and then try and drop a little bubble of water right over that window we've made. So that basically is our microscope. So we can use that to look at things. So here I've got a map, which is really small with lots of fitting letters. And if you slide it in between the letters and then look directly through that little drop of water, you should hopefully see the text or whatever you're looking at, a piece of leaf, anything you've got lying around really that will fit through, looks bigger. So I'll just put that to one side and I'll hopefully you're doing that at home. Um, basically, I'll just run through how a microscope works. Um, so basically, it works like a magnifying glass, which is probably something you're more likely to have at home than a full microscope. Um, so you have a lens, which is a curved piece of glass. Um, and the fancy word for that is convex. Um, and as we've said, we've used the water instead of glass for that. And when you look at something normally, the light comes into your eye, hits the back of the eye, and basically projects an image of what you're seeing. But upside down and the brain's very clever and it understands how to flip that the right way so you can see what what you're seeing if you use this lens it changes the path of the light so the image you're looking at comes together like that when it hits your eye and that means the brain sort of sees it as closer to you which is why it looks bigger and you can play with how convex that lens is to make it whatever you're looking at bigger or smaller essentially like if you use a camera when you zoom in or zoom out it's a similar sort of thing and that's what we do in pathology so those pictures i showed you you look overall at the slide and then you zoom in see the target area and you can see the giardia and things like that so yeah that's how to make your own microscope um hopefully all is going well at home with you guys making them and you're looking at things but 
any questions, just put them in the chat and let me know. Thank you, Erin. That was that was very blue, Peter. It was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and good to hear about how how microscopes work as well. So, um, yeah. So, if you do have any questions at this point? We can also um, ask more questions at the end. Um, I have a quick question about what's what part of the body do you most commonly look at under the microscope in your work, Erin? Oh, you say? so by mix. It's a real mix. Um, so, because I am only I'm a very junior trainee, essentially, I'm still at school. Um, I'm still learning every day. So every two weeks, essentially, I look at a different part of the body. So um, most recently, I've been looking at lots of bone and muscle, which is why I had those pictures to hand. Um, but I could look at anything from the body, anything you can think of, really, um, can come to us to look at. Right. And um, if you had something in the gut, like the one you were showing, the Jardia, would you then speak to someone in microbiology or would you just know and be able to report that or...? Potentially, yeah. So um, one thing we do as well as when we looked at the stains and how they were pink and purple. So we colour the slides to help us look at them under the microscope, but we can also apply special stains. Um, so we can apply a stain to that. If we think we've got a bacteria or a parasite and we know what it is, we can apply a special stain. And that's what we tend to do with Jardia. Um, so then it will light up and be like, okay, this is Jardia. So then we'll tell the, whoever sent the samples, that might be your GP, that might be a doctor in a hospital, um, or potentially with microbiology. And we kind of work together and feedback to make sure everyone involved in patient care knows what's going on. Right. I think that's, that's a nice example of how different pathology teams work together. I think there is definitely a, the team needs to work together to get diagnosis sometimes. Yeah. Definitely. Well, um, if anyone has any questions for Erin at this point, do put them in. We actually had one for Giuseppe. Sorry, I missed that. Um, it said, Giuseppe, is it horrible to take bacteria from the body? It's from Masood. No, it's not. I mean, we take samples all the time. I mean, we receive samples all the time and samples can have bacteria on it. No, we live, bacteria live on in our body. Fungi live on our body and yeah. We live together. Sometimes they're harmful, other times they're just harmless and live with us. That's so true, isn't it? Because I guess there's lots in our bodies that do good things, like in our gut. There's some good yeah. friendly bacteria in there. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Erin. And we'll come back to you um, in a while for more with more questions, I'm sure. So uh, we're moving on to a video now. So um you may have already watched this video, but if you have the materials to run the um, the clot thickens activity, which is related to haematology. So haematology is study of is um is blood medicine. So all the study of blood. Um, and I'm going to share my screen and show you the video of how to do this. So is everyone ready with their water, red food coloring, and um, and cornflour? Choose your own pathology adventure pack. We have an activity all about how blood clots. So for this you'll need a microwave but you can do the warming ahead of time. So into one glass containing a little bit of water we've added some food colouring, some red food colouring and you can use any type of red food colouring that you've got. And this is to represent the blood freely flowing in our body. Now in another glass, we're going to do the same. So this is a little bit of water and some red food colouring again. But this time we're going to add a teaspoon of corn flour. And stir it in. Now this is the glass that you'll need to microwave. So make sure your glasses are microwave safe. And this needs to be microwaved for 30 seconds on high until it bubbles. And so we'll show you that one now. 
So this has been microwaved and you can see how gloopy it looks in there. Now this represents clotted blood. So we can look at the difference here. You can see how free flowing this one is and how gloopy and jelly like that one is. Whenever we get a cut, a whole series of events known as the clotting cascade or the coagulation cascade takes place to make our blood clot and form a scab. Blood that we collect during blood donations could actually clot too, but by adding sodium citrate into the blood bags, this stops the clotting cascade from taking place. Okay, so I hope um, you've had a go at um, making your own blood, clotted and fresh. Um, and if you've ever had a cut and you've noticed it clot up and scab over, that's what you've just watched um, in the clot. It's called a clotting cascade, so something to look at later. Um, we have some other activities and I can include that in the email I send round to attendees afterwards called Blood and Bugs. And that tells you all about how haematologists um, work and um, how they how blood donation works. And it was mentioned in the video there. It also tells you a bit about the history of it and how it was all discovered. So um, yeah, but back in the First World War, um, they still weren't, didn't have blood transfusion in the same way as we have now. So it's a really interesting activity pack and I'll share that with you afterwards. Um, if anyone has any questions about blood or hematology, um, so obviously Giuseppe and Erin don't work in that area um, and Tatra and I definitely don't, we're not pathologists, but um, We'd be happy to take questions and um, we can actually get answers back from haematologists that we that we work with um, if anyone has any specific questions. So yeah, okay. I think we're okay at the moment. Okay. Um, Giuseppe, I think we're going to share the everybody's antibodies activity. Thank you. Um, we're gonna try and make some uh, antibodies and try and see how they they work and um, you probably will have the material to try and do it you can try and cut the y shape out of paper i've been using some post-it just to try and and folding them together and uh, make the different parts of the uh, the antibodies i mean antibodies are proteins that we have in our body in our immune system and the reason why we've got antibodies is that uh, uh, they'll help us to fight the uh, the infections the way the antibodies are um, are designed with this uh, particular y shape uh, there is a trunk which we will do with a different color just to show that it's different from the other two bits let's do it in blue and the trunk is the part of the antibody which is not um, doesn't change, uh, you know, within the different antibodies. And the other two parts of the, the, the antibody that do the Y shape uh, are called um, antigen binding fragments. They are the two parts that actually bind the antigen. Antigen is a structure which could be on bacteria, on viruses, which is recognized as something foreign by our body. So when the antibodies are made, they will have, I'll just wrap them with some cello tape just to fold them together. When the antibodies are made, they will have this area here, two areas at the end of the Y shape, and these two areas, they will uh, um, recognize foreign parts, uh, foreign organisms inside our body, and they will attach to them. And they, by doing so, they will ask other immune cells to come along and try and help to fight those organisms. For the activity, once we have done the Y shape, which represents the antibody, we can just put a clip, and this would be our antibody ready to fight the different organism. What happens at this stage? If we find something that potentially the antibody can bind, then they will end up binding it and then neutralizing it. And then we'll have other cells that will come along and will try and uh, 
uh, eat the organisms. Let's say go a little <clears throat> nice bacteria. The antibody, yeah, doesn't recognize it. Doesn't recognize any of these foreign objects. Let's say if it does, if they do recognize this, uh, um, uh, this cocci, this bacteria. Yeah, they did. It shows that uh, um, this specific antibody was uh, specific for this particular kind of uh, uh, organism. And any time we'll find it over and over again, if they are produced during an infection, after an infection, or if they are produced under a uh, after a vaccination, every time they will be able to bind the specific antibody. What happens if there are lots and lots of different bacteria all together, which uh, are invading the body? Let's say you've got lots of different bacteria, and they are trying. We are trying to find fight an infection, we will have <clears throat> huge amounts of different antibodies all produced against this different bacteria. Some of them, they are specific for it, they will bind, and some of the others, they will not. And this is what we call an antigen antibody immune complex. Is a complex and is an association between the antibody and the antigens. Once lots of different organisms, bacteria are bound, bound, you know, are bound together by different antibodies, they'll be recognized by the cells that go along to try and kill them all. And this is how the immune response works against the different bacteria. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, and so every single um, virus or bacteria that you get, you will, you'll have a different antibody. To, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And there will be different kind of antibodies produced even against each specific virus or bacteria because there will be different structures on top of the bacteria and the virus. They'll be recognized. That's why we'll have lots and lots of different antibodies. Great. And um, we've all heard lots about the COVID-19 antibodies, haven't we? And I know that some people will have, will have got them because they have had COVID and others will have them now because they've been vaccinated. Um, do you know much about, I know they're still trying to work out how long people who've had COVID, do you know how long they have the antibodies? We don't, we don't know exactly yet, do we? <clears throat> yeah, we don't know exactly. And I think it's because it's such a new disease that will take some time to try and understand how long people will have protective antibodies. I think the different difficult thing is for some organisms, even the presence of antibodies doesn't 100% mean that a person cannot get uh, reinfected. Antibodies and immunity is, uh, sorry, antibodies are just a part of the immunity that we can develop against organisms and against bacteria, against viruses. There is a lot of other cells like B cells, T cells that are involved into the immunity and cannot be quantified. As, as well as we, we we can do with antibodies. And where do you find the antibodies in the body? Are they in the blood? Yes, yeah, they are mainly in the blood, and they can be they can be transported by the blood, and they can go into all the different tissues and attack, you know, the different organisms. Great. Well, thank goodness we have them. That's good, isn't it? If we yeah. have a cold and things, the reason why we've got over it or not caught it again is because we've got antibodies. So yes. Great. Um, does anyone have any questions about the activity? Um, and we have one again from Masud. Thank you for your question. Who is this? What is the strongest antibodies or the bacteria? I guess um, maybe what's the what's the most dangerous bacteria? Maybe is that the question? The strongest bacteria? I don't know. Mm, difficult. Yeah. Different bacteria can cause different bacteria can cause different diseases in in different people. Some bacteria that can be completely harmless to someone that they can be causing very nasty, nasty infections. I'm sure Erin will have seen loads of different diseases caused by bacteria that in other people would be completely harmless. And that's the beauty in a way, if you see, of the studying how the different organisms like cast and bacteria and viruses play together and, you know, 
of a, a, a connection between ourselves and how we can try and fight different organisms in different ways. Okay, um, any, any other questions? How many good bacteria are there discovered? Hmm, that's a good question. Don't know if you know the answer as to that. We, as, um, as you were saying before, Penny, in our gut, we've got lots of bacteria that mm -hmm. we carry and they're harmless and they're potentially good. And, you know, they, they have a function in order to allow us to digest some of the food that, that we eat every day. So yes, there are lots of very good bacteria and that's the part of the struggle sometimes in our job. Because when we were talking before about the culture, when we were talking before about when we have a sample and we try in the lab to see which bacteria are on it, part of the difficulty is trying to understand which ones are the good bacteria and which ones are the bad ones. But not, not all of them are bad. Sometimes might just be there because they're just colonizing. We say they're just on top of a, our skin or into our urines or in other parts of the body and they might not be causing any specific infection. Wow, okay. And um, with antibiotics, um, am I correct that they some of them will kill lots of different bacteria and some will kill just one or two is that right yeah different antibiotics work in different ways and they're very specific sometimes to specific bacteria so some of them we call them broad spectrum so it means that they will kill lots and lots of different antibiotics all together and this is very good on one side and very bad on the other because they can kill lots of anti lots of uh, bacteria which are actually good for us mm -hmm. some other antibiotics are actually narrow spectrum we say so they actually specifically kill the organisms that we want to kill in that specific moment and that's good because they allow us to preserve all the other bacteria that actually potentially are good for our body right okay we've got some really nice questions coming in um asaya i'm, pro I'm sorry if i pronounced your name wrong and um, why do some people have different types of immune systems it very much depends which kind of infections you have overcome in the past. So you might have, uh, have had an infection and maybe you developed just these two different kinds of antibodies and maybe you had lots and lots of infections. So you have huge amount of different antibodies and maybe you even got vaccinated against other infections. So you even got all the different ones. Once you have had the previous infections and once you have been vaccinated, then for a long, long time, you will still be able to have a certain amount of antibodies. Not forever, not for all the diseases, but for certainly for a long time, you'll be able to have a huge amount of antibodies specifically against those organisms that you have had the previous infection for or you've been vaccinated. That's good. And that brings us on to another question from A. Ellishaw. How do you make antibodies for a vaccine? Maybe it's um, a slight misunderstanding about vaccines. Do you want to just explain them briefly, Giuseppe? Yeah. So once you have uh, you've been vaccinated, it means that part of uh, the organism, either a bacteria or a virus, uh, has been injected into your body. And you tend to develop an immune response to this part. This is a kind of controlled infection compared to the infection that you will get in, in, you know, naturally, which could be potentially even devastating. Once you develop that specific antibodies, then you could potentially be immune to that disease. So in the future, if you were going to get exposed to that organisms, you wouldn't develop an infection because you would already have antibodies to fight against the bacteria. Right. And then um, what, what's in the actual vaccine? That The antibodies are not in the vaccine, are they? <clears throat> no, they will be part of uh, the organism. It very much depends, again, in different diseases. Sometimes they could just be a, um, an inactivated toxin, we say. So if the bacteria produces a toxin, then we would have a similar toxins, but which doesn't cause any infection. Or you can just have one of the protein of the virus or different um, kind of yeah, you know, molecular uh, molecular material like we have seen, for instance, recently with the SARS coronavirus 2, which contains RNA, so part of the molecular um, component of the virus. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Erin, I'm going to give you a, a, um, a question maybe that's not in your specialty area. Can cats have a disease? Can cats have diseases? Um, yeah, I don't see many cats, unfortunately, or fortunately, because I quite like cats, so I wouldn't want them to be poorly. Um, but yeah, basically every living thing can develop a disease. Um, uh, so any animal you can name will have its own diseases. Some of them will be the same ones that humans get. Some of them will be ones that only cats can get. But even things like trees and plants can get diseases. So yeah, unfortunately, cats can get diseases, um, which is why we have vets. Yeah, we can um, send you lots of information about our veterinary pathologists. Yes, there... yeah, there are people who do my job just for animals. Yes, definitely. Um, should we maybe move on to the last activity and then we'll go back to the questions, if that's okay with everyone? Um, so the final activity, my colleague Taj is actually, who's, um, who's very creative, has um, to show you how to make your minuscule models of bacteria and viruses, so I will pass over. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Um, so today we're going to be trying to make some models of viruses and bacteriophages. Um, so I had some fun last week making some. So here are some that we made earlier. My housemates helped me with these. So this is uh, a model of a virus, for example, coronavirus um, to SARS-CoV-2. And this is um, quite a funky looking thing called a bacteriophage. Mine is a bit lopsided, but um, you can try and make yours a bit straighter than mine. Um, so to make these, we um, I used some um, modeling clay. So, um, we used air dry clay, which is a bit like plasticine. So this is, they come in different colors or you can get them as plain colors, um, which you can then paint afterwards and they're quite squishy. Um, but once you've finished your model, you leave it to dry just uh, in a room somewhere and they become hard um, and they're quite light as well when they dry. So um, you can keep them for as long as you like. So to make the virus, you just create a little ball and then um, we just use some cocktail sticks. So we can use match sticks or anything that's sort of spiky to create the spikes and just put them through. You can either cut them in half and poke them through or you can just sort of like this and you put quite a few round um, tips. Be careful with the sharp tips. Um, and then to create these little balls, you just create um, smaller balls using the same or different colours. Um, but Giuseppe would be able to help us understand a bit more about um, why viruses are um, the shape. So Giuseppe, would you be able to tell us um, a bit about the general shape of viruses, for example, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that um, yeah. makes um, it In general, virus. yeah. Yes, please. Thanks, thanks, Dacha. And um, coronavirus, uh, corona in Latin means crown, and uh, the shape of the coronavirus is actually, yeah, does resemble a crown. I mean, in general, the virus will have an inside, an internal part, which is the capsid, is the protein bit, which contains the nucleic acid. And then all over outside, there will be a, um, an envelope, a, um, a membrane, which will cover everything else. All over outside, there will be some spikes, which are the proteins that um, uh, Katja was showing. Yeah. And those are the ones that are the key to unlock the entry into the cells. And for instance, the antibodies that we produce after vaccinations are specifically against those locks. So basically, they'll go and they block, they will block the spike and making sure that the virus is unable to to go into the into the cells. So the antibody attaches onto this yeah. little ball bit here. Yeah. If someone has got infections, because the virus has also been inside the cells and has been disintegrated, then they will have also different kinds of antibodies against some in, internal parts of the virus, which are called like the core protein, which are parts of the virus that are inside and they will be exposed only once the virus has been destroyed by the cells inside the organism. So inside this body bit here, the main body, 
this mm. contains something special. Could you tell us what's inside that? Yeah, so inside the, the capsid, they will have the, the um, nucleic acid. It could be DNA or the RNA. And that, that's the main component. That's the code which will tell us, you know, will basically will regulate how to make a virus effectively. So once the virus goes inside the cells, then it's not able to replicate by itself. It's not able to, to like produce another virus by itself. We'll give this piece of molecular material to the cell and will allow the cells to produce lots and lots of those, forcing the cells to produce lots and lots of those. So the viruses basically hijack yeah. our own cells and use the tools in our own cells to create more and more copies of the virus. Exactly. So very clever. Um, are all viruses this sort of shape? Or do you get different shapes? Different no, viruses? there are different shapes. There are different shapes. And some of them could be, uh, could have an envelope outside and some others might not have an envelope outside. And you've shown before a bacteriophage, for instance, which has got a quite a funny shape. It's interesting because the bacteriophage, effectively, the same name means is a bacterial eater. So basically, uh, specifically infect bacteria and not just, uh, uh, for instance, human or animal cells like some of the other viruses. This uh, fascinating, even the same way that the, bacter the, the bacteriophage can squeeze the DNA from the bottom inside the cell that uh, uh, infects and uh, yeah, and they will, uh, will replicate yeah, from there. The DNA will be pushed inside the cell and then uh, will go through the same cycle, infect the cells and allow the cell to force the cell to replicate. It's interesting because bacteriophages at the moment, because they can infect bacteria, they can infect good bacteria, but also bad bacteria. And they have been used, they are starting to be used as uh, instead of antibiotics. So they could potentially, can potentially produce a virus which acts against a bacteria that you have been infected with. It can be used possibly as an antibiotic. So we can use the shape and the function of this yeah. for our own, yeah. to, for to our own. help yeah. us. Um, getting over some other diseases. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, so in the, in the pack, in the Choose Your Own Pathology Adventure pack, um, we mentioned that the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, that looks a bit like this, is about 0 0.1 micrometers. That's really small in diameter. Um, are all viruses this size? And, and how, do you, how do you look at something that's so small? Yeah, so viruses could be obviously of different sizes. There are some much, much bigger and some others much smaller. We wouldn't be able to see it with the same microscope that Erin uses. We would have to use some specific microscope, which are called electron microscope. In reality, these days, we don't diagnose viruses this way. We don't see viruses under the microscope anymore. Everything is done through molecular testing. What we do is to try and see if inside a specific sample, inside a fraud swap, for instance, if you want to see if someone has got coronavirus, if we see any RNA, any molecular material of the virus, if there is, then it means that someone has got a specific infection. And this is how we diagnose viruses these days. And that's what we use for COVID as well, we use the, the swabs inside them. Brilliant, thank you, Giuseppe. Um, so I hope you'll get a chance to make bacteriophage or virus, um, please do share images um, of your creations with us um, at RCPath on Twitter or Instagram. Um, and we look forward to seeing them. I'll pass back over to Penny. Thank you so much, Tadja and Giuseppe. I, I just learned lots then, so I hope other people have as well. We've got lots of questions coming in. Um, and I just wanted to quickly mention as well, if you want to send us, email us photos of your creations um, I can I'll I'll send you the email address afterwards um, but we we maybe could, could then display them on our page with our choose your own pathology adventure pack because I think it's nice for others to see what what other you know all the creative things you've done at home so yeah um, if you are not on social media that's another option we'd love to see your creations um, okay so we've got quite a few questions um, there's a question about what foods help us with good bacteria so 
Giuseppe, I'm thinking of like probiotics. Are they that good or are there other things we can eat? Do you know? Um, it's difficult. It's one of those things that uh, we're still struggling to, to understand whether or not they are completely good or potentially they don't help us particularly. But yes, potentially probiotics that, you know, basically a yogurt which might contain different kinds of uh, bacteria. Yes, it could potentially be 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 good and sometimes it is used in order to reallow what we call the the bowel flora so which which are all the bacteria that live inside our tummy to rebuild again especially someone had a bad infection yeah i guess if you've had antibiotics you might some of those good ones might have been killed by them is that true Yes, this is exactly what happens. Yeah, okay. if someone has got antibiotics, especially very strong ones, then all the flow, all the bacteria would have been killed. The good one and the bad one. Okay, um, Lucas asks, what happened to the Black Plague and is it still around? <laughs> Black Death, is it? Yeah. Yes, I mean, it it's not around in the same way as it was in uh, during uh, the Middle Ages. But yes, I mean, this. This disease hasn't even disappeared and yeah, they are still around. And I think part of our job is making sure that they don't reemerge again and we treat them as soon as possible, as soon as they they appear. And we can treat, we do have treatments for the black plague now, which unfortunately didn't have in medieval ages. Um, yeah, exactly. So we can treat them. So it's very, very rare and very like small pockets of places around the world, but uh, we do have a cure, which they didn't at the time. Wow. Um, so is that the one that's carried by rats or fleas? No, is that another one? Yeah, rats. Oh, rats, okay. And what bacteria is it? What's the name of the bacteria? It's uh, Yersinia. Okay. Uh, yeah. And you can still find pockets, as uh, Herring was saying, of, uh, of uh, um, this, uh, this bacteria all over around the world. But... Um, these days, it's very rare in uh, in uh, in the Western world. Okay, yeah, I didn't know that. That's a great question. Thank you for that, Lucas. Um, so we have a question from Masud. Um, is it true that bacteria goes in when you when you are not cleaning yourself? So, a question about hygiene. If you don't wash or clean, is that true that you'll get more bacteria? Um, yes. I mean, if, if, if specific specifically, you're looking at some bacteria that might be around and then you are not uh, uh, washing your hands properly then yes potentially yeah 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 you can get you can get infected and that's what we do in the hospital i mean the hospital compared to um the rest of the population around potentially could be colonized by very resistant bacteria which can be all over around the hospital it could be very dangerous for all the people that are inside the hospital so we have to constantly be washing our hands and making sure that we put alcohol jab just to minimize the chances of transmitting those bacteria from one person to the other. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, we, we all heard the the common, like the regular reminders to wash our hands, haven't we, during the pandemic? And I think it's just good for general, for any kind of bacterial viruses, it's good to just always be washing your hands and making sure you're keeping as clean as you can, I'm sure, yeah. Great. Um, this is a really nice question from Dan. Um, do you inherit antibodies? We do, yeah. And when we are born, um, the mum can transmit some of those antibodies, not all of them, but a specific subset of those antibodies to the, to the child. And that's very important in the first few months, up to four or five, sometimes even longer months after birth. That's the moment where infections could be much more dangerous into the little baby that is born. But luckily, thanks to the mom's antibodies that pass through the placenta, then those infections tend not to happen. Unfortunately, sometimes they might happen if the mom gets infected at the same time as the baby. Okay. And, um, and I know that babies do get quite a lot of jabs in the first couple of years of life, don't they? And I guess that's for those antibodies they haven't got. <clears throat> Correct, yeah. yeah. So this is, this is why we start to give antibodies after a few few months, just to try and make sure that they start to build their own immune system and they start to you know, develop you know, immunity to, 
some of the, 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 the organisms that we want to protect them against. Okay, and a little bit of follow up from the question about animal diseases um, from anonymous person. My cat had a bacteria, which I know that, yeah, you can, cats can get um, bacterial infections, can't they? So I guess, would they use antibiotics in the same way? I know neither of you are veterinary pathologists, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a lot harder to get antibiotics into a cat. I don't know if anyone, I'm sure anyone at home has tried to get tablets into cats or dogs. It's very tricky. Um, but yeah, there are antibiotics for cats and dogs and pets. Okay, great. Um, what is the most dangerous virus ever discovered? I think this is a question usually answered in terms of, in terms of which is the virus that will kill most people if uh, uh, people will, will catch it. And I'm sure some of you will remember a few years ago the epidemic of Ebola in West Africa. The Ebola is probably the most deadly virus in terms of uh, the proportion of people that would die if they caught it. It depends on the way you see it. That's one way of seeing it. Another way is, uh, which is the virus that uh, almost certainly will kill you if you get it? That's rabies, for instance, if you don't get any vaccine or any immunity. <coughs> Sorry. And the other way to see is, uh, which virus can spread around the world and kill so many people? Well, we've seen an example over the last year. So I guess you can answer this question in lots of different ways. Yeah, that's so true. Um, Lucas has a question. If the Siberian glaciers melt, will diseases come out of the ice? Oh, I don't know. I don't, do either of you know? <laughs> Quite a, it's a good question. <laughs> we had this question at Book Club as well. Someone asked the same question. Oh, did you? Yeah. We had an event last night. Similar question came oh, up. Previous, yeah. Previous um, oh. I don't think any of us have the answer to that. Mm. It's a great question. I'd like to yeah, know. Question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there might be some, some organisms that can hibernate and be able to survive for a long period of time. From time to time, they do discover them in Antarctica, but I wouldn't know how many of them would come out and they would be harmful. I mean, some of them might just be harmless to humans. Let's hope someone's doing some research on it so that they're <laughs> getting ready for if that does happen. Um, are there bacteria, it's Lucas again, are there bacteria out there which could kill all humans? Mm. Um, Sometimes people answer this question um, in a way saying probably there wouldn't be any specific gain from uh, a bacterial population to kill everybody because once they've killed everyone, then they wouldn't have any other way to infect anyone else. So I don't think any organisms has got the idea of killing all of the population that is going to infect. This is how we usually see it. Some organisms can be particularly deadly, but they would never kill 100% the, the populations that they infect, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to transmit to someone else. So I don't think out there there is a bacteria at the moment that will be able to kill um, everyone. Let's hope that we don't discover it. Um, we, two people have asked <laughs> a question, which food can cause salmonella? Mm. Good one. I mean, lots of different foods. Sometimes the 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 the, the risk is associated potentially to eggs, but there could be different kinds of food that could you know they could be associated with it. Um, it's it's difficult because it it depends on different parts of the world. There could be different strains of salmonella which could be associated to different kinds of uh, infection. Sometimes the risk is not even associated to food. But we go back to the questions that some of the people were saying before. It might be associated to animals and exposure to animals. The salmonella is quite widespread. Okay. Um, do you get antibodies from mother's milk? That's Dan again on the same theme that he asked about earlier. We do get some antibodies from uh, uh, mother milk. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. I'm not sure the proportion of antibodies that you get will be significant in terms of immunity. Because obviously, a part of these antibodies will go into the digestive tract. It wouldn't be particularly significant in terms of, you know, general immunity, but you do get some antibodies from it. Great. 
Uh, and we've only got a few minutes, but we'll hopefully get through the rest of these. Um, Dan has another question. Is global warming causing more viruses? So that's an interesting one, um, considering the current pandemic. <clears throat> it, does, it does, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, it does, because uh, um, some of the viruses, for instance, are transmitted by different organisms, for instance, by mosquitoes or by different animals, and they can move around. And inevitably, global warming has got an impact. We now see diseases in areas that they didn't have them anymore. Some diseases have disappeared from areas where they were before, but there are lots of other diseases, and now we see them in areas which they didn't used to be as warm, and now they are. We have seen all over the years in Europe lots of virus disease that have emerged and they were not there before. And unfortunately, the chances are that even disease which are let's say tropical, then one day they will reappear in, uh, especially in Southern Europe. Great, thank you. We're going to answer the last two questions and, and then we will say thank you and, and goodbye. So what is containing the Nipah virus at the moment? Nipah? N-I-P-A-H? Is that? I haven't heard of that. Um, can you repeat the question? What is containing the Nipah virus at the moment? Nipah? Might yeah, be Nipah. Yeah, I don't particularly work with with this, so I wouldn't know. Sorry. Okay, no, that's that's okay. Um, and is it true there is a bacteria which is shaped like an apostrophe? That's Masud. That's a nice a nice question. Like an apostrophe? Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> there are some Quranian bacteria. Maybe they can have this like Chinese letter uh, shape. Maybe that's what. Yeah. yeah, they do come well, in lots get... of different shapes. Mm, Sorry, Erin, yeah. what were you saying? Yeah, just so you can get little rods, which I guess they would kind of look like little apostrophe. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, um, thank you so much uh, to Erin and Giuseppe and to Tasha for the fantastic models as well. Um, and thank you all for your great questions. I will send you lots of links, things, um, some of the things that have come up today. We've got various activities that relate to those, so I'll try and include all of those. And please do fill in the feedback form on how you found the session today. Um, and yeah, as I said, please share your, your photos of the things you've been making with, our, with the activity pack and share my final slide. So we have on our website, we have our careers pages. And if you go to the area of the website called Discover Pathology, you'll find lots of activity packs, including the Choose Your Own Pathology Venture. There are lots of other activities in there, um, but there are also, like, I think about 20 other activity packs. So there's lots of things you can explore. Well, there are 17 different specialties in pathology, so there's lots to learn. Um, and please do follow us on all the social media channels, um, particularly Instagram and um, YouTube. We've got lots of videos and content for people looking interested in careers in this area in the future. Okay, well, thank you again um, to our speakers today um, for all your time. And um, yeah, and I hope to see all of our attendees again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.